Richard, for your kind introduction. By now, it should dawn on you, I am as old as I look. <laughs> it's a very special occasion for me uh, to address you in this place on that subject. And I want to flag uh, my partisan approach to the subject. Um, and it's also a very emotional encounter. I'm one of those post-World War II born Germans who in their teenage years raised that question of what had actually happened. And uh, I think I'm one of those of that generation who believes in the never again slogan, at least to the extent even if it happens again and again and again that we stand in a history which should alert us that we, as long as we live, try our best to contribute that it maybe for future generations will never ever happen again nowhere in this world. So I'm very nervous because of that connotation. And I'm very grateful that uh, you felt interested enough to come and listen to me. William Faulkner once in the theater play Requiem for a Nun in 1953 said the following, the past is never dead. It is not even past. So the subject I'm talking about is not confined to history. The subject lives on. And we have different ways we can relate to that subject and other subjects. Many in Germany until today say, ah, come on. How long do you want us to go back? Should we then go back to the time when the Romans invaded the, uh, what is Germany today? And dismissing those things. While for those living in Namibia today, who are the descendants of the Nama and the Ovaherero and the Damara, it is not history. It lives on in their world. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the oral history they are sharing from childhood onwards. So there are different perspectives. And being aware of different perspectives does mean there is no exit option we are confronted with making choices. We could say, I don't care what happened then, leave me in peace. Or we could say, if we are serious about reconciliation, about future, about human decency and integrity and moral values, then we have to care. And then it means the past is not dead, it is not even past. And we can only try to come to terms with it by acknowledging it and looking into ways how to deal with it. There is a recent Hollywood movie called Woman in Gold. I'm almost certain many of you know about that movie. <coughs> And I would like to share one side story of that movie with you because it very much relates to what I'm trying to say. <coughs> it's not the main court case, but there is an Austrian activist who supports Helen Mirren as the one who claims for the restitution of what belonged rightfully to her aunt, the Gustav Klimt painting. And he considers his solidarity as a special kind of patriotism. Being an Austrian citizen, that is for him a special kind of patriotism, motivated by the desire not only to be reminded of your nationality when it is shameful or embarrassing. Patriotism can mean to revisit the dark sides of a society and trying to address them 
That's an act of patriotism. I would very much wish that the German speakers in Namibia and the German government and the wider German public would realize that it's not to vote for the AFD these days, but to stand up and face what happened in the past and go even further back than the horrible Holocaust days. To look at the trajectory, what happened, when, maybe why, and how we can contribute to sensitize that it hopefully will never ever happen again. So I will use the next 30 minutes or so to rush you through 110 years. The mission impossible, I know, but then there is time for questions, I hope, and then you can alert me to the things you consider have been missing or where you would like to hear more. Because the point of departure is indeed what is termed in local perspectives in Namibia, the Namibian War. And it started in 1904 and lasted five years with fatal consequences subsequently. The Namibian War was sparked by the fact that what was declared in 1884 as German Southwest Africa, a protectorate, that's the euphemism which is not new, euphemism existed all of the time. Uh, in German the term was Schutzgebiet, a protectorate. Who did they protect? Not the local population, because the encroaching settler colonialism took the land from the locals, <coughs> subjugated them, humiliated them, abused their women, until in 1904, the Ovahevero were the first to rise in arms against the German settlers. And the then paramount chief, who was appointed a paramount chief by the colonial administration, because they wanted to have a collaborator, Chief Samuel Maharero. Before that, there was no paramount chief among the Herero. <coughs> and the pressure, seeing what happened to his people, issued an order where he said, don't lay your hands on women, children, missionaries, Boers, or British. And it was almost completely followed. I stress that because in the colonial apologetic version, the justification of the response to that militant action by the Ovaherero was the Herero committed atrocities uh, amongst everyone. They maimed children, they raped women, and so on. But it's on record that of the 140 plus people killed, almost exclusively were white German farmers. That's not a justification, but it was a resistance against a system which threatened the existence of the local people. And while the German Empire was caught by surprise, it immediately lashed out, sent strong troop enforcements to the colony to execute an extermination. They appointed a colonial officer who before had been fighting in the Chinese enclave and whose slogan he wrote in a letter was, I'm going to extinct, extinct the natives with floods of money and floods of blood. And that's exactly what happened. Within several months, the Ovaherero gathered around the Waterberg mountain plateau. There were some military encounters in late July, early August 1904, and unable for both sides to get a military success over the other side, the Ovaherero decided to withdraw into the Omaheke and try to find other ways to re-enter into safe territory in then Southwest Africa. 
But General von Trotha, who was that officer in charge, ordered his troops to fence off the Omaheke and not allow any of the Herero to return. On the 2nd of October 1904, he issued an extermination order where he said, the Herero have forfeited to be subjects under German rule. I will not allow neither children nor women or anyone else to return to this territory, otherwise they are killed. We are making no prisoners. And in the second order, which was by those who are tending to seek excuses and say, wow, that, that was not genocide. In the second order, he issued to his soldiers, if women or children return, they should, should shoot above their heads to force them back in the waterless Omaheke. And colonial apologetic interpretations say, you see, he didn't even ask them to shoot them. Well, instead, he asked his soldiers to do something even worse, to force them back into the waterless Omaheke, where they were starving or dying of thirst. As a result, it's estimated that between half and two thirds of the Omaherero of these days did not survive. Being confronted with this extermination strategy, the Nama, in the German colonial jargon uh, called Hottentots, something, a term used also in the Cape, went to the arms at a time when the Herero were already defeated. And in contrast to the Herero, they embarked on a local guerrilla warfare, which lasted four years and made it very difficult for the Germans to decisively uh, defeat the Nama groups. In 1905, von Trotta issued another extermination order against the Nama with a similar um, message. And revisiting the Genocide Convention, which I come back uh, a bit later, it's important that the Genocide Con uh, Convention does not quantify the number of people killed. It's the intent to destroy, which is the decisive element that qualifies genocide as genocide. The intent to destroy. And in both cases, the intent to destroy was obvious. Estimates suggest that out of the Nama population, a third to a half did not survive the war years between 1904 and 1908. And again, you have the colonial apologists until today who start to argue, well, these are numbers, they are highly debatable. They are not debatable because it doesn't matter what the concrete number is. It's not debatable how many were killed in the Holocaust. It's not debatable how many were killed in German Southwest Africa. It's not debatable how many were killed in the killing fields of Cambodia, or in the Gulag, or in Rwanda, or in Southern Sudan, or nowadays in Myanmar, Burma with the Rohingya. It's not debatable because it's the intent to destroy. And it has other consequences, which the Genocide Convention alerts us to. If you prevent people from continuing the way of living they used to live, it is genocide. And the laws issued in German Southwest Africa, as from 1905, did exactly that. It took the remaining land from the Nama and Herero, it placed them into reserves, it introduced apartheid. Make no mistake, apartheid is not invented in South Africa. 
It's a German brand in Southwest Africa. The survivors, who they then finally used as prisoners of war or forced labor, were put into concentration camps. And again, colonial apologetics tend to say, yeah, but concentration camps, then they started at the Anglo Boer War and they were used to be called concentration camps in German Southwest Africa, but it's not really concentration camps. No. Do you want to enter a debate what qualifies for concentration camps? In Shark Island, outside of Literitz, and this is uncontested, the mortality rate among the prisoners of war was 80%. They suffered from being unprotectedly exposed to the climate, from forced labor, from malnutrition. 80% of the prisoners of war on Shark Island did not survive. Actually, it doesn't really matter what you call that, except that this is genocide. And mind you, while the debate is that this is something very specific German, the German Sonderweg, the special trajectory from Windhoek to Auschwitz, which is a very crude simplification, but also has a meaning, but I think it's misleading to call it Sonderweg. Because actually, it would imply that could only happen in Germany. I think that would be downplaying colonial organized mass terror in other parts of the continent and the rest of the world. It could have happened elsewhere if you look at colonial practices. And it's very interesting that the archives of the colonial office in London, which are now accessible, tell a very revealing story. The Cape government here knew exactly as from 1904 what happened in neighboring Southwest Africa. They had Cape police officers accompanying the German troops who reported back in shock and dismay, especially about what they witnessed on Shark Island and elsewhere. And the Cape government agreed with the colonial office in London that this is a matter they don't care about. They rather prefer to continue making business because the Cape Colony earned a lot by offering the supply to the German troops in Southwest Africa to implement the extermination strategy. Arms, ammunition, oxen for the transport routes, food. And London said, leave it. And Shark Island was actually rented by the Germans because it was British Cape colonial territory mm. until the end of 1906 before a deal was made that it becomes part of what was called German Southwest Africa. So actually what happened on Shark Island until the end of 1906 happened on British territory. And the British and the Cape Colony knew about it and didn't do anything. Their consciousness became only active after World War I, when the famous or infamous so-called Blue Book was published, where they argued that Germany was not worth to be a colonial power because it was not civilized enough. And that Blue Book was based on eyewitness reports of the years 1904 to 1908 by the Cape Colonial Police Officers, which actually testified to the fact that they knew then and didn't do anything. So much for the history, because otherwise I'm running out of time. I have to skip several decades for reasons that should be known to you. Namely that what happened then in Germany after World War I was giving way to a Heim ins Reich colonial propaganda back to the empire, meaning 
to glorify the colonial past and to complain that the colonies were taken away from, uh, uh, from Germany through the Versailles Treaty, but it was not critically revisiting what happened in German Southwest Africa or any other of the colonies. In German East Africa, the mortality rate in the so-called Machi Machi rebellion was much higher. It had a different meaning because that was executed mainly by Askaris. Those were basically uh, mercenaries recruited from uh, today's Mozambique, so black soldiers in the service of the German army. What happened in German Southwest Africa was executed by German soldiers. And it was happening in public daylight in Germany, with postcards sent back <coughs> where they showed Herero women cleaning heads of Herero men before the skulls were sent to Germany. We had in Germany in 1907, I believe, what was called the Hottentotten elections, where the government was seeking additional money through elections for the militarization. And that was with reference to the warfare in German Southwest Africa. So that was basically a genocide in public limelight. But it was considered to be part of a civilizing mission, interpreted in a way that if the natives are resisting the civilizing mission, they have to be exterminated. So, not surprisingly, until the 1950s, actually strictly speaking until the mid of the 1960s, that dark chapter of German history was laid to rest. Mm. One could say after the romanticizing era of the 1920s, 1930s of uh, colonial romanticism, where one of the colonial novels was actually reprinted for the soldiers who were in front of Stalingrad. It was Horst Frenzen's uh, novel Peter Moore's Fahrt nach Südwest, which was republished until 1944 in 500,000 copies and was given to the soldiers at Stalingrad as Schützengraben Literatur, <coughs> which shows the kind of reproduction of a certain mindset that the colonial <coughs> approach, exterminate the brutes, could be to some extent translated into the context of the late 1930s, early 1940s. But then the colonial amnesia was total. As much as you know as the amnesia as regards the Holocaust. While Germany is nowadays considered a world champion in commemoration of the Holocaust, it took quite some time to remind our parents and our grandparents to face up to what happened. It was not a voluntary act. It was also the time in the late 1960s where for the first time two PhD theses were published. One in East Germany, the German Democratic Republic by Horst Drexler, and one in West Germany by a history professor, Helmut Blei, who by using separate approaches reached similar conclusions that what happened in German Southwest Africa would meet the definition of a genocide. The one Horst Drexler had access to the colonial archives in Potsdam and made use of the official documents of the 1904 to 1908 time, which gave him credibility, which is denied to him until the very day by colonial apologetics, who always dismissed him as calling him a GDR historian, which by implication means ideologically confused, you can't take him serious. No matter that he indeed quoted everything with empirical evidence of the colonial archives. Interesting enough, Helmut Plei was never labeled as an FRG historian, which of course that would of course be the corresponding ed, uh, ed, um, label you would give. You have the GDR historian and you have the FRG historian. Well, actually his work never featured as prominently, despite the fact that he actually used Hannah Arendt's theory of the elements of totalitarian rule 
who already Hannah Arendt pointed out that if you fully want to comprehend what happened culminating in the singularity of the Holocaust, you have to go back to what is perceived the good old days and see what was the mindset in German colonialism. But despite the relevance of their work, which is frequently quoted today, it still was an area of the long denial. I remember in 1984, civil society, mainly church-related civil society, tried to use the centenary of the Berlin Conference to bring back into the public domain of then still West Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, what was decided in Berlin in 1884-85. And it was an uphill battle with hardly any success. Actually, if you look at what was published in 1984, the colonial apologetic nostalgic literature was still very much dominant. And the arguments which you face now, a couple of months ago, with the controversy around what Helen Sillet tweeted before she left Singapore, the argument was Robert Koch was at the end outweighing Karl Peters. So meaning all those achievements under colonialism were far more important than the negative side. Something which I call the Autobahn argument. And I'm again sure that many of you know immediately what I'm referring to. Because we heard it as teenagers. Well, not everything was bad. After all, the Autobahn was built. I'm pretty sure it doesn't convince you. Why should such an argument convince those suffering under apartheid, be it in South Africa or in Namibia or anywhere else in the world where their humanity was denied, where they oppressed, and modernity was introduced because it suited not the interest of the natives, but the interest of the colonizers. The roads were not built for the natives. The hospitals were not built for the natives. <clears throat> the schools were, if at all, built for the natives to indoctrinate them through Bantu education. What is good about that? Well, 1984, as I said, still made the point. Not everything was bad. Actually, we don't have to feel guilty. We don't have to show remorse. Very interesting, it was Uwe Tim with a novel who actually changed slightly the public discourse when he published at the late 1970s, um, Moringa, which was a novel actually not about Morenga, the guerrilla leader in southern Namibia, but about a German veterinary who abandoned the colonial army. But it highlighted the atrocities of the time. And from there, gradually, only taking shape since the turn of the century, we had something which is now widely referred to as post-colonial initiatives in Germany. It's a bit misleading because it suggests uh, we are in the era after colonialism. That contradicts what I said at the beginning, that the past is not dead. But what it means is a new engagement sensitizing to what happened under colonialism and reminding the people of today that we are a product of these days and that if we like it or not, we have internalized certain fundamental values and assumptions which go back to these days. In other words, it's the horror within. The words of Mr. Kurtz on his deathbed in um, The Heart of Darkness. Or as Dark Hammarskjöld put it, the longest journey 
is the journey inside. Start with us, with the values that have shaped us, that guide us, and question them self-critically, at least at the same time, if not even before we start to criticize others. We have not really learned the lesson. <laughs> Let me quickly now, time is running, I'm sorry. You, are you generous enough to give me another 10 to 15 minutes? Of course. Thank you. Um, 2004, the 100th anniversary of what is called the Battle at Ohamakari, where afterwards the Obahirero were driven into the Omahika Desert. The then German Minister for Economic Cooperation, being in charge of so-called development aid, Heidemarie Witscherek Zoll, also referred to as the Red Heidi, not only because of her red hair, which she has until the very day, just that it doesn't look as natural nowadays as it <laughs> tended to look then. Attended the festivities at Ohamakari, and she made a very emotional speech, battling not to cry, and asked for forgiveness in the sense of the prayer. And those in attendance said, where is the apology? And she replied, my whole speech was supposed to be an apology. Which for many among the locals in attendance came across as a turning point. Not so for those in Germany. The then German Foreign Minister, Josef Fischer, ironically from the Green Party a Foreign Minister, declared that the minister just articulated entirely her private view, and the German public media, especially the Bild Zeitung, declared it as a typical example of an emotional woman being carried away. Which displayed another interesting parallel between racist discrimination and the perception, the demeaning perception of women. Heidemarie Witscherek Zoll thought when she's back in Germany, she's rid of her ministerial posts. That didn't happen, but nothing else happened. Because the German government continued to say, we have adopted a resolution in the German Bundestag, the parliament, in 1989, declaring a special responsibility for Namibia prior to independence. And for them, that was enough because they said, Namibia receives per capita the highest development aid of the whole of Africa. Now, given that the total population of Namibia is 2.4 million today, it doesn't need to be a huge amount to say it's the highest per capita expenditure that Namibia receives in terms of development aid. They can pay it out of the, in Germany you would say, out of the Portokasse for the mailing. But the point was that they said also the special responsibility, if you revisit the resolution, included, of course, the special responsibility for the German-speaking white minority in Namibia. And one would have assumed that that includes to address the history. Because if we're serious about reconciliation, then we need to build a future. And we can only build a sustainable future if we critically revisit what happened in the past. And it's not good enough to say there's a white minority and our special responsibility includes the white minority without answering the question, why is there a German-speaking white minority in a country in the southwestern part of Africa? They did not fall from heaven. And the commercial farms they occupy, the biggest part of the commercial farms, how did that come about? But the German government continued with the denial until the middle of 2015, where almost by accident, another centenary changed the official discourse. 
that was the Armenian genocide, already recognized in France and controversially discussed in the German parliament. And in mid-2015, on the centenary of the Armenian genocide, the German parliament adapted, adopted a resolution acknowledging officially that what happened in the Ottoman Empire in 1915 was tantamount to genocide. And you had a fuming Turkish president, Erdogan, who went lashing out at the German government and saying, who on earth are you daring to accuse us of genocide while you are in denial of what the United Nations actually recognized as the first, officially recognized as the first genocide in the 20th century, that is what happened in German Southwest Africa in 1904 to 1908, which, admitted by the president of the German parliament, was quite embarrassing. <laughs> And as a result, only weeks later, after the mainstream media in Germany made it also into a very prominent subject and is debating those double standards and the moral hypocrisy in prominent TV shows, only weeks later at a press conference of the foreign ministry, the speaker of the German foreign ministry was repeatedly questioned by journalists so what do you say about what happened in Southwest Africa? And they also referred to an earlier draft resolution which was submitted by the SPD and the Green Party while they were in opposition. That was before they were in government, the big coalition SPD and CDU, with Steinmeier, now the foreign minister, but then part of the SPD revolution which was not accepted, that draft resolution already said we need to recognize the genocide. And now you had him as a foreign minister. So his speaker then said, if you want to call it genocide, call it genocide. In passing, like that. But of course, it was a fundamental change in the discourse. As of mid-2015, the German government was on record, in the absence of a resolution of Parliament, which still has not recognized it, to recognize what happened in Namibia in 1904 to 1908 was a genocide. And as a result, since um, the end of 2015, the German and the Namibian government appointed special envoys to negotiate how to go about dealing with that recognition of genocide. Which sounds great, isn't it? Wow. Well, at a closer look, it's still very embarrassing. Because part of the negotiations from the German side is, let's discuss how we apologize. Just imagine a German government after World War II who says, Let's discuss how we apologize. If you recognize the genocide, you're not discussing how you apologize. Just imagine, I would now go in front of all of you and give Richard a slap. And then I would be in denial constantly. I said, no, I never slapped him. No, no, of course not. And a few weeks later, I would say, OK, OK, I have slapped you. Let's sit down and discuss how I apologize. <coughs> this is a humiliation to the people in Namibia. If you admit a genocide, you apologize as a point of departure for further negotiations. You're not saying now let's sit down and discuss how to apologize. This is now at the matter of discussion since two and a half years and six rounds of meetings. And another core issue is, of course, you recognize the genocide. If you apologize for the genocide, what are the consequences and implications? That goes back to 2004, 
because under the foreign minister Joschka Fischer, the parole was keine entschädigungsrelevante Entschuldigung. No apology which is relevant for reparations. Because that all of a sudden makes it more than a German affair. Because one might wonder, okay, you apologize, you acknowledge guilt, you document remorse by offering sufficient compensation. You can't make things not happen, they happened. But you can address them in different ways. And offering compensation to the descendants of those groups affected would, have be, would be one of the few possible steps. But it would open a Pandora's box because it would indeed create a precedence. Not only for other issues pending when it comes to Germany, not only for the other colonial atrocities in East Africa. The negotiations with Greece, with Italy, with parts of Eastern Europe, all pending because of a legal argument by the German government that we don't deal with that because legally it's irrelevant, would be put in a different perspective if you would say in this case, okay, which they could, they could afford that. But interesting enough, rather, now, the discussion is, if there is maybe something they can agree with the Namibian government to compensate and put aside more money than the development aid to invest in infrastructure to the benefit of mainly the descendants of the people uh, that were killed in the genocide. So they are very cautious to avoid the term reparations. And one doesn't need to be a fan of conspiracy theory to assume that that most likely already has been discussed behind closed doors among foreign ministers in Brussels. Because as we can observe, it's very closely followed in all the Western capitals of former colonial powers, what the negotiations between Namibia and Germany are about and what the implications might be. At the time being, there is parallel a court case going on in New York where the Ova Herero and the Nama, who have not been included officially in the Namibian-German negotiations, are seeking under an Alien Tort Act, which is in New York or in the US, allows them to claim against Germany because of the crime of genocide. And the Nama and the Herero from Namibia, but also from the US, a group, and from Botswana, have that claim with reference to a convention adopted by the United Nations a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, with the votes of Germany and Namibia, which is on indigenous minorities and says, if indigenous people are concerned, they have to be part of any of the matters that negotiate their situation. And they say, we are left out in these negotiations. And also reducing it to bilateral negotiations between the German and the Namibian government excludes those descendants of the survivors who continue to live in Botswana or in any other country of the world. The German government has refused to accept the court claims with the argument they are not a party that deals with that issue. And this is where the international legal aspect comes into the picture, also when it comes to Greece or Italy, that they say, whatever crimes were committed in the past by German soldiers does not mean that the German government of today can be held accountable. Therefore, we don't accept the complaint, the claim. As a result, the court has already postponed twice a meeting because the German side, the accused, did not show up. 
The second meeting was last week, Thursday, but very interesting, so there were several people in attendance speaking German who declined to reveal when journalists asked them why they are there and who they represent. So it seems the German government is indeed interested to see what's happening. And the judge has now postponed it to March next year for a third time in hearing in the court to decide if the claim is accepted or not, because that's still the situation. I think I should, should try to find an end now. Let me maybe quote from the special envoy of Namibia, Dr. Seth Gaviruwe, because the, Namibians, uh, the German side presented a response to the Namibian side, how to go about the next uh, negotiations, and they came up with their own agenda. Basically, as they did the last two years, setting their agenda and expecting the Namibians to respond, which is another insult. Who is setting the agenda if you don't at least do it jointly? The Germans setting the agenda for the German Namibian negotiations over what they have recognized as a genocide? And Dr. Set said that the prescriptions the German side pointed out suggest that it's a medical prescription issued by a doctor in Berlin. <laughs> but from a Namibian point of view, he added, a medical practitioner in Berlin cannot alone decide on an adequate treatment. He insisted that the matter of reparations will remain on the table during the next round of negotiations. <laughs> I started with something I want to come back in conclusion. We can make choices. <coughs> Being in the history of perpetrators does not mean that we are doomed continue in that history. As much as unfortunately being in the history of victims does not protect one to become a perpetrator. It means each and every one of us has to make own decisions and choices. Call it moral choices. I don't think anything is obscene or anachronistic about morality. Trying to be human is a moral challenge. I can't make unhappen the German past. But I can try that the German past doesn't repeat itself in the present or in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Melba, I don't think that um, we've had many speeches of this nature in this room, uh, which come from such a personal place, such a professional place, such a, an unbelievable sense of history, of, 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 of politics, of, and of humanity. And really, it's really, um, it's really a, a real privilege to have heard you this evening. I'm bring you the microphone. If you please just identify yourselves and, um, and then ask your question. Please keep them brief so that we can have as many as possible. My name is Victor Brook. I used to live in Namibia from 1990 to 1997 with my wife, and we know Dr. Melba from that time. Is it not the case, uh, Dr. Melba? I'm currently reading Timothy Snyder, Black Road, um, and he's the author of uh, a previous book called Bloodlands on the lessons of the Holocaust. Is it not the case that the contemporary rulers of German Southwest Africa regarded the native people uh, as vermin? people to be got rid of, 
and they quoted the American situation with the Native American Indians and said, well, this is what the Native American Indians did, and this gives us justification for what, what we are doing, and that was taken on in the Second World War. Should we take a few questions and then respond? Hi, Professor Norworth, Bernice Brook here. I'm Deepu Busman and Lean, and I was first year English students, literature students, and you said something very enlightening to me. I've always thought that black people occupied the lowest realm, but I'm classified as so called mixed, which is coloured. And one of my cousins presented a paper at the United Nations Conference for Racism. And she said that colored people had no homeland to go to. We were at the bottom of the pile. We were actually regarded as rubbish. And that's what Ethel Fugo said in Kusman and Linda. And you said something about the intent of a genocide. When you remove people from their home, and you know that what the apartheid government did to 60,000 people and just move them to the Cape Flats. And I just wanted to know if that, would you regard that as genocide of, of robbing of us our, our house, our home, our position, our space. Identity. And that, of course, community, identity. Community. But then they regarded us as having no identity, having no color, no culture. Thank you. One more question. I'm Margaret Liebing. I lived in Namibia for quite a few years too. And I have friends there who are Germans who got farms. This reparation, in my mind, says, and I'm going to cry, I'm sorry, that they've got to give their farms up to the black people in reparation. Is that right? Uh, we'll have another round. Yes. So we'll have another round of questions. Okay. We'd like to deal with those. Thank you. Um, what Victor raises indeed the pat pattern uh, for mass extinction of human beings by simply denying them the status of human beings. And that goes back to the early years of the era of enlightenment. It started more than 500 years ago with a uh, debate between um, De Sepulveda and Bartolome de las Casas about how the South American Indians are treated. Because de las Casas, as a missionary, argued the Indians in South America <coughs> basically qualified to be educated towards becoming human beings, while the blacks from Africa do not. And he used that argument to say, replace the Indians for the forced labor in the mines where they were dying like fleas um, through African slaves. And that is the pattern. You, we, that's the pattern until the day. Vermin, cockroaches, you name it. You call people names, baboons, whatever which deny them recognition of human beings, which lowers the threshold. I think part of that even, I might be wrong, but I think part of that even is you take away from people the clothes before you send them into the gas chambers, because you take away individual outer signs of individuality of human beings. You deny them to be an individual to be recognized as a human being. And that happened with indigenous uh, people in the USA, in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia. Mind you, those were genocides too. Settler colonial genocides. And the first step is, you say, they are not human beings. Vermin. Trash. And that's what Peter Moore's Fahrt nach Südwest, this uh, colonial novel which was republished until 1944, had as a message. They don't qualify as human beings, and they resist to be civilized as human beings, meaning to be domesticated by us, though they have no right to live. That's exactly the pattern, and it lives on. 
as we know from Rwanda, as we know from uh, Burma these days. It's all the time the same pattern. You deny human being the recognition of being perceived as human beings. Um, your question on the colored people is, is a very tricky one to answer because Raphael Lemkin, if you go back to his original notion of genocide, included that if you deny people the status of citizens protected by a state in their own right, that's genocide. So if you translate it into what the German term would be Vaterlandslose Gesellen, being with no country and no protection from a government, that would, in the original meaning of Raphael Lemkin, who, by the way, also started to make reference to German colonialism when he introduced the term genocide, would qualify in the wider sense as genocide. But that notion was negotiated for two years before it was adopted in the United Nations, and it was watered down and reduced. So many of the elements Lemkin wanted to see as part of a genocide convention are not in the genocide convention any longer. And that's a tricky issue until the very day that bothers the International Criminal Court, the ICC, because there are a lot of current uh, initiatives to enhance the notion of genocide. South Africa, prominent example, Tabo Becky's uh, denial of the root causes of HIV AIDS. You have the treatment action campaign and others who argued that borders to genocide because it cost by implication the life of several hundred thousand people. Strictly speaking, that for lawyers is a nightmare because they say then we can't use the genocide definition and convention any longer in a court because the genocide convention might be narrow, but if we don't stick to the narrow def definition of the genocide convention, it's useless in court if it's opening up to all the interpretations. So that, would say, so that means, actually, depending from what perspective you look at it, the answer is yes and can be no at the same time. It's a very tricky issue. And it's interesting that in the ICC criminal procedures, not a single accused admitted and was sentenced because of genocide. They all were willing to accept at the end crimes against humanity or war crimes, but not genocide. This is the ultimate crime that Churchill called a crime without a name before Raphael Lemkin, because that's the worst that can happen. And not a single person in this world has before courts yet <coughs> admitted to committing genocide. And that, that is part also of the challenge. How do you give basically a consequence to the term genocide? The land issue in Namibia is exactly a reminder of the situation that colonialism is not a past. And it is a huge dilemma. If I look at those who are now occupying the farms, their fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers had that farm. Are you telling them they're not supposed to occupy the land? I do understand that because I went with them to school and was with them in, in hostel, those who are the farmers today. But if I would have been a son of a farm laborer, knowing that the very same land is the one which my ancestors occupied and where they are buried, and some of the farmers, not all, some of the farmers don't even allow them to visit the graves of their ancestors, which you have in South Africa as well, with the argument, this is private property and you're not entering my private property. Then I'm almost certain I would have a very different view. Which means the land question is a priority to find an amicable solution, whatever that means. But it was a long argument since 25 years towards the German government. If you are serious about reconciliation, then play an important role in A, putting aside sufficient money, 
and facilitate the legal transfer of land from a white minority to a black minority where the ancestors have been living in that part of the territory. If it works, I don't know. But if you don't try it, it's a time bomb ticking. And I know many of those in my age group, or at least some, who say we would rather give away the land if we are compensated and move like our parents to Somerset West or to Swakopmund and retire. If someone gives us the money we want for our land, okay. And it certainly would not solve the economic issues in Namibia, because Namibia is not a country where you can really live from the land. That's slightly different in Zimbabwe and in parts of South Africa with the annual rainfall and where you can till the land. That's not possible in Namibia. But the land question is not predominantly an economic question. It's a symbolic issue. As long as the majority of the commercial farmland is in the hand of white owners, colonialism continues to exist. And it's not possible to change that perception among the local people who were driven from the land more than 100 years ago. So the next step actually should be to say, German government, please put aside sufficient money that would allow the Namibian government to purchase commercial farmland at market-related prices and redistribute it among the local communities. If they then live from that or not, that's not the question. Another round of questions? My name is Linda Thorne. My question is directed to follow on to your, your, your previous question. But what about those the other people who benefited from it? As a result of the decimation of the Herrera people, the Obama people have gained power and are in power. And to what extent are they having to get back as well as a consequence of, their, of the death of all their Herreras? Hi, good evening. Michiel Andries from Pretoria. I'd like to know who provided weapons to the Herreras and the Namas to fight against the Germans. question. And this is going to be the last one for the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for your, I think, uh, very ins insightful, uh, you know, presentation. Um, I was in, in, in Venduk. I arrived on Sunday. I went there for my research. I'm actually a PhD scholar. I look into the, the role of museums, particularly natural history and ethnographic museums in the construction of race. And one of the things that I deal with is the question of the human remains, the skulls of people who had been, you know, looted or rather stolen, either from the graves in, 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 you know, in Namibia, particularly at Ashak Island, when people were dying there, museologists from here cross borders to collect the skulls of the chiefs and kings and leaders of the Nama and the Herero there, and those were sent to, to, to Berlin, uh, and some were sent to, you know, to the United States and, and, and other parts of, of Europe. Now, I just want to you know, ask a question. What, what is your take on these human remains? Because it has recently been you know, unveiled that some of the skulls are basically at the Museum of Natural History in New York, especially those that were you, you know, uh, you know, sold to those museums there because there was a race science that was being developed to undermine the humanity of black people. So I just want to, want to hear from you, what's your take on that, those, those human remains, and other human remains that are still in, in Germany? I know that 20 were repatriated back, 
but it appears to be that there's more that museums are still hiding behind because they're still holding on to those as trophies of war. And I just want to hear your, your take on that because some people have argued that these museums also have become sites of colonial crimes. That's where the crimes of, you know, the colonial crimes were committed in these museums. How do we go about repatriating these human remains so that we can restore the dignity of our people? Thank you very much. That's it. Uh, thanks for the question. It's uh, opening actually the subject of another lecture <laughs> uh, when it comes to the lasting impacts of the Namibian war on the demographic situation of today, which is not part of what you talk about. Uh, not even among the descendants, at least not in public discourse uh, of those who were killed. But indeed, hypothetically, but it is hypothetical, so the question is of course, why make it a matter of debate? But hypothetically, the situation in Namibia today would be very different if the Herero and Nama would have not been decimated to the extent they were. And the Damara, by the way, and the so-called Bushmen, uh, they were what we would call today in modern euphemistic language collateral damage. The Damara were killed because the colonial soldiers were not able or did not want to differentiate between the Damara and the Herero. And on the Bushmen, you had hunting safaris until the 1920s. So we are talking, Mohammed Adikari called it a genocide in slow motion. What would be the situation today if this mass violence would not have happened? It would be very different, yes, of course. Um, but even the Ovahir Railroad do not officially raise the issue. But there is a sensitive aspect to it, and it relates to land. Because the Namibian government has started uh, more than 20 years ago with land redistribution. And also people from the northern parts of Namibia who are now, among others, because of the genocide, the dominant population group and the home basis of Swapo as the government, are also entitled to get land in other parts of Namibia as part of the land redistribution policy. Now imagine for a moment you are a Nama in the southern part of Namibia and there is land purchased by the government for resettlement and there comes a family and not from the north but a family with origins in the north being a higher ranking official in one of the ministries and becomes a weekend farmer being resettled on that land but have no roots in that land or in that part of Namibia. Which has caused uh, a lot of friction and tension more recently and the Land People's Movement, a deputy minister for land has been uh, ousted from office because he criticized the government for that policy and saying what you're doing is betraying us people. You continue with a similar discrimination. So the land issue has several perspectives. And I mean, I should leave it at that. But it also means, of course, you can't make things not happen. And you can't change it back. But you need to be very sensitive in the way a government today handles the issues and claiming in the bilateral negotiations, we represent all the people. And the over here, and Nama say, but what do you mean with representing all the people? Those who were the victims of the genocide were not those in the northern parts of Namibia. You talk about us. So how do you can claim that as a government you are, you are negotiating on behalf of all people, you should negotiate on our behalf? And if you discuss resettlement and land redistribution, you have to discuss how can we get the land back of which our ancestors were driven from and not bring anyone from the north to occupy that land in the future. So that's really a contentious issue and another time bomb ticking. The weapons 
as far as it can be reconstructed in the 19th century, were mainly coming from the Cape and even through missionaries in trading negotiations throughout the second half of the 19th century, when missionaries tried to involve local communities to bring up in war against each other for their own hidden or not so hidden interests. So the irony is that the modern weapons came to some extent by Nama groups who came from the Cape in the first half of the 19th century. They crossed the Orange River and they were on horses and they had modern weapons which they brought along and they brought along actually uh, Christianity because they were already Christianized at the Cape and in the Northern Cape. And there were trade links with European traders, even including German traders initially, and missionaries who supplied certain communities in Namibia with arms because they instigated conflict among the groups because they thought they would be the ultimate beneficiaries. <laughs> so that's part of the history where, where the modern uh, weaponry came from. They were imported by pre-colonial, early colonial agents. The skulls is one of the reminders I couldn't uh, relate to in, I already was talking too long, I couldn't uh, use as an example. Indeed in 2013 or 2012, I believe, for the first time, 20 human remains, skulls, uh, were transferred from the charity in Berlin back to Namibia. And that highly symbolical act already illustrated the discrepancies. You had more than 40 people from Namibia visiting Berlin for that transfer of the skulls, headed by a minister. They were not even re received once from a German minister mm. while they were in Berlin. And in the transfer of the 20 skulls, a uh, state secretary from the German foreign ministry was there and her official speech simply read out an earlier press statement, which was a complete offending humiliation. Mm -hmm. And when members of the audience from the German post-colonial initiatives um, tackled her, she left before the Namibian delegation could speak and take the skulls. Mm -hmm. And when the 20 skulls were brought back to Windhoek, the international airport is 30 plus kilometers outside of Windhoek, people were queuing from the airport to town mm. to give reference to the return of the skulls of their ancestors. And for a week they were displayed and people every day paraded and paid their reference. And one of my friends told me, when she was there, there was no other white in the group to pay reference. And she said, I wish we would have been there and show that we do care. Since then, a second uh, number of skulls have been repatriated. There are new discoveries, basically almost on a weekly basis in Germany. They are in the basements of museums, in hospitals. It's estimated that more than a thousand skulls alone, mm -hmm. never mind other human remains, are still at, uh, in German museums, anthropological collections, um, hospitals, tucked away. And they are more by accident discovered. Mm -hmm. And then the problem of restitution is you have to identify where are they coming from. Because these human remains were not only brought from Southwest Africa, they were from all parts of the world. This was the time, the early 20th century, where the anthropological studies uh, started, which culminated in the madness. And they used material from the colonies. And you don't know where they are from. That's the first step. And that's a very tricky and time-consuming task to identify where are those human remains from. And then find more or less adequate ways 
to bring them back to the people that they can be buried with the decency the people want to have the skulls of their forefathers and foremothers uh, buried. The last uh, delegation that attended now the court proceedings in New York last week also visited the New York Museum where they discovered a total of seven skulls out of which six are identified. Those are Herrero, Nama and one uh, Bushman skull. And they will negotiate how to return them. They were part of a collection of a uh, rather famous or infamous German uh, anthropologist who never was in the colonies but collected the skulls mm. for his own <coughs> research. And obviously they were then given away as donations and something else for other parts. As a sign of friendship among colonial powers? <laughs> I don't know. But it's another reminder that the mm. past is not dead. Mm. It's not even past. And on that, uh, on that note, we will end this evening. And just to thank Professor Melbourne.